Greeks are ahead of Jupiter, 60 degrees. And these, these are, these are in, uh, in Lagrangian points, which are gravitationally neutral points. And they just rotate there. It's just crazy. If, I've got a uh, video, if I have time, I'll show you. It, it's, it's, it's celestial mechanics at its best. It's, it's just beautiful. Well, there's a weird effect that can happen in these things. For asteroids that are smaller than 30 to 40 uh, <coughs> kilometers, this effect is called the Yarkovsky effect. Now, <laughs> this is interesting. Asteroids are generally dark, and light can heat them up. Well, they're also rotating. And when they rotate away from the sun, they will radiate in IR that, that light that hit them. Well, that radiation causes a very tiny amount of thrust. And over the course of millions of years, something that's in a stable orbit can go into an unstable orbit because of this and change its orbit. So, so the smaller ones can, yay, millions of years from now, boom, you, you can't, it's, once you find them, you've got to keep observing them because their orbits can change. So let's talk about some scale here. Now, micro, well, meteoroids, these things, again, these are from microscopic to one meter, and there's, there's trillions of these things. Micrometeorites, these are really cool. I've actually found some of these uh, in my gutter. And uh, you can do it with a rare earth magnet. Just swipe along your gutter. You'll get some pot ash, but you'll also find some of these things. And these things are the remnants of the, the small meteoroids that uh, burn up in the atmosphere. They're, they're microscopic, and here's a bunch of them. They're just beautiful. I love these. A lot of these have some metal inclusions, which is probably why the guy found them. So here's uh, some smaller asteroids, again, these two. And there's Aikata, which I showed you. Now, this thing's a, a half a kilometer across. I'll give you an idea of what that is. There's an aircraft carrier next to Aikata in, in your football field. So you can get an idea how big that is. Now, there's some asteroids, and there's Aikata circled. So, yeah, uh, Lutetia is the, the big one there. And what's interesting is this guy right here, Matilda. There's a giant crater in Matilda right there. And uh, Matilda is a rubble pile. I mean, I look like it from here, but it is a loosely bound pile of rubble. And something hit it. And if it had been solid and stony, that impact should have shattered that. But it didn't. So what they're, what they're summarizing is, think of it like throwing a snow, uh, uh, bowling ball into a snowbank. The snowbank's going to go thump, and the snowbank's not going to explode. That's exactly what you got here. So there's Letitia um, up there compared to Vesta, which the Dawn probe visited in 2011. I'll be going over that a little bit. And after Vesta, things start getting round. Ceres, uh, the Dawn mission, is going into orbit right now. I gave a lecture on that yesterday. No science data yet. We just went into orbit around it, so be very interesting times. 15% of the near-Earth asteroids that have been found are binary. I mean, they'll have a companion, and they're not necessarily just one. There are, there are some that have multiple companions. Well, this is an interesting story. This is a rubble pile asteroid that's spinning so fast it flattened out, and this Yarkovsky effect is probably what got it spinning. Well, it, it kicked it just enough that it fissioned off this companion. And you'll notice the companion is tightly locked, it's always pointing toward the body. When it, when it ripped off, it would have stole some of the angular momentum from the parent body, which would have slowed it down a bit. And uh, so there you go, so that's what we got. Looks like a cupcake. I mean? Looks like a cupcake. Yeah, it's kind of good. It, it's loose, it's, it's sand, but it's spinning so fast that it did that. So the impact probability, what you got here, the, the dinosaur killers, the, the big ones, the chits of the ones, those, those happen on a, a relatively infrequent, thank goodness, time scale. But the ones like Chelyabinsk and smaller uh, happen all of the time. Chelyabinsk is about, uh, no, what, 20, 30 years. The Tunguska is about a century or so. Now, these figures are being changed a little because they recently found out that um, after, after Chelyabinsk, the US government are, agreed to allow uh, uh, spy satellite information when they detect an asteroid impact because those spy satellites that are looking for launches are great at finding asteroid impacts. So they're allowing that information. And also, I don't know if you guys remember the nuclear test ban treaty from a long time ago. They built these infrasound sensors all over the planet. And uh, those detected the Chelyabinsk impact. 
the whole planet rang like a bell. And uh, so those, they, they compiled the data from those two and they found out that uh, since 2000, uh, we've been hit like 20 times. Some of these were city killers, but we're 75% water, right? So, they, but the ocean goes, boom, nobody's going to care. Except the well, yeah, so there's the orbits of potentially hazardous asteroids, and there are like 1466 of them right now. And uh, blah. So you see, they're, again, they're all over. And this is only looking straight down. You can't see the way they're going all over in 3D. So infrared imagery is great for finding Arnold Schwarzenegger in the jungle, and it's also really good for finding asteroids. Now, if you've got, let's say you've got three asteroids at the top here, and you've got, you've got a really bright, same size, bright, middle, and dim. Well, in visible light, you're going to look bright, middle, and dim, right? But in infrared light, these are going to look exactly the same. So uh, infrared light is really good for finding them. The other thing you can do with infrared sight is determine the size of an asteroid. Again, the top. A small bright one is going to look in visible light exactly the same as a dark large one, but in infrared you can see the, you can see the size difference. So infrared is really good for finding them. What do you do about them? Now, that's the question. Well, one method that's worked so far is the impact method. Now this was uh, from uh, uh, D, the Deep Impact Probe, and it, it sent this impactor. And it hit this comet, and they, they took spectra of it and everything. But the important was, the thing is, is that they hit a comet with it. And uh, it's been likened to hitting a bullet with a bullet. And it's quite amazing. Uh, the gravity tractor, and I, I particularly like this one. The way this works is you have a heavy asteroid, and you've got you know, a light space probe, or a heavy space probe. But what it does is you position this thing next to the asteroid. And it has ion thrusters, like on the Dawn probe, which are thrusting very lightly. So it's maintaining its position, and it's heavy. Eventually, it's going to start pulling the asteroid toward it very slowly. If you can do this 10 years in advance, you can deflect an asteroid a couple centimeters is all it needs. 10 years later, it's going to miss the Earth by a huge margin. Pretty interesting, but... This is being uh, developed by the Planetary Society, and this is also pretty interesting. You take a bunch of laser satellites, solar-powered laser satellites, and you blast a spot on the asteroid, essentially creating a jet-like thrust. And uh, oh, the, the, the Planetary Society is actively uh, pursuing this. There's a whole bunch of other deflection strategies which I researched, and some, some of these are crazy, some of them uh, are not so crazy, but None of them have been tested. What are you going to do? Now the problem is, with the, after, after you, you've got to find them first. Before you can deflect them, you have to find them. Well, let's go into a bit of history here. I like injecting history in my, election, my lectures lately. So meteorites have been falling on the planet since the planet formed. That's how they form. And, uh, and they've been a part of Earth's history, and they've been a part of human history as well. I mean, humans have observed them since they've been humans, and they've been picking them up since they had hands. And uh, throughout history, they've been venerated as sacred objects. That uh, one down there, they actually, uh, the, the Clackmas dipped their, uh, their, their spears into it before they went off to battle. And uh, they've been, stories have been told around the world of the same thing. Uh, they've been made into jewelry and weapons. I like the top one. They've been seen as omens. The, these guys, the, one guy believed that if you saw a shooting star, it was good fortune. But if you saw more than three in one night, you were doomed to die. So the next Perseids, stay home. <laughs> I love this. This is a, a dagger made from a meteorite. That's just gorgeous. So, in sixteen, <laughs> in six sixteen in China, this is this is this is fantastic. This siege tower was actually struck by a meteor. The meteor didn't kill anybody, but the collapse of the tower is what killed them. And this was really interesting. There's a whole paper by Donald K. Owens. I should actually give this to you. It's, it's fascinating. It uh, talking about. Uh, Meteorite falls in ancient China, and the only ones that they were taking into account 
or the ones that they actually found pieces of. There were a lot of falls, and uh, I got to imagine that there were a lot more that they didn't find stuff of. But, okay. So, 1492, um, this uh, meteor fell in uh, in not what, what is now France. It was actually etched into uh, what's called a broadsheet here. And there it is. That was the remaining piece. In say France, uh, this was witnessed by a bunch of people. Too hot to pick up. Guys analyzed this and found iron and sulfur in a rock that, or, that fell from the sky. And they didn't consider that to be in any way extraordinary. 1794 was the first time uh, uh, anyone was able, anyone suggested that meteorites were from an extraterrestrial order, origin, and he was immediately ridiculed. He is now, uh, this Ernest Chalotny is now considered the father of modern meteoritics. Wold College, this is a, this is a uh, fall witnessed by several people over clear skies, left a crater, and uh, I love this, refuted the most popular explanations Forming, uh, forming meteorites, lightning and condensation in clouds. How do you condense metal out of clouds? I don't know. So that in uh, 1800, the solar system looked like that. In 1801, a new planet was discovered, Ceres, by a, uh, a monk, Giuseppe Piazzi, and uh, they watched it for uh, several days before it went into the halo of the sun and they lost it. They found it again a few days later. Next year, another new planet. Both of these between Mars and Jupiter were, was discovered. And uh, that, that same year, the analysis of that Wald College fall came back. And uh, the guy that did the analysis said, hey, you know, this is not earthbound. This is from, this is from the sky. And he was mocked, as well as was what you do back then. In 1802, uh, Sir Frederick William Herschel coined the term asteroid to mean star-like to describe these things that we're seeing at uh, the moons of the gas giants and the asteroids and stuff. Another fall in France, this one was witnessed by countless people, all mocking of how it ceased. Uh, things were falling from the sky, nice clear sky. So it was established that meteorites are, are coming from space, but their origin remained a matter of debate until uh, fairly recently. Between 1804 and 1807, Two more planets between Mars and Jupiter was discovered, and nobody thought that those uh, you know, very out of the plane of the ecliptic orbits was weird or anything. Between 1807 and 1845, nothing. Yeah, map makers didn't have to change anything. 1845, they did. Another thing discovered between Mars and Jupiter. So the, the growing list of things between Mars and Jupiter. 1846, Neptune was discovered, so map makers are going, come on guys, what's going on? I love all these old maps. I found a whole bunch of them doing this research this last week. I want them for my wall, they're awesome. 1847, three more between Mars and Jupiter. And in 1847, uh, uh, scientists uh, threw their hands up in the air. And they, they, the first four that were discovered, they reclassified as asteroids leaving or more there, and then they discovered a whole bunch more between Mars and Jupiter in 1851. They finally said enough. They re reclassified all those between Mars and Jupiter as asteroids. And uh, about that time, about this time, his term asteroids became accepted. And there it is. So, in shortly after that, Phobos and Deimos were discovered. It's pretty interesting. There's a debate right now whether Phobos and Deimos are captured asteroids, or re-accreted bodies from a Martian impact. The Europeans think it's a re-accretion. The American astronomers think it, they're captured asteroids. The only way we're going to be able to tell is a sample return mission, which the Russians tried, but the thing burned up, and it failed a few years ago. Max Wolf used time exposures to uh, find asteroids, and he found 248 of them that way. And uh, that's quite impressive. And uh, for the next hundred years, photographic plates was the way you found asteroids. 1898, the first near-Earth near asteroid was found. And in 1903, 
Um, Beringer uh, surmised that this giant crater in Arizona is not volcanic, but an impact crater. And this thing, uh, this thing is huge. I really want to go there. My daughter lives really close, and she's taunting me. We must come see it. She's right. So there, there's a uh, uh, there's the largest piece they found that fall. They figured it was about the size of like 150 meters across, and would not have wanted to be near it when it hit. It would have been very very big. Uh, Max Wolf, a few years later, found the first Trojan asteroid out near Jupiter's orbit. First Centaur asteroid in 1920. And these these are pretty these are odd beasts. They're un, they're in unstable orbits. Their orbits cross the uh, the orbits of the outer planets, and uh, they, they have you know, dynamic lifespans of a few million years. They're they're very short lived. This one, Sikote uh, Aline, Sikote Aline. This is over Russia in 1947. This fall, that's an artist rendition of it. It was so big, they made a stamp out of it. <laughs> And it said here, it's, uh, it was uh, 100,000 kilograms. It was a gigantic fall, and I actually have a little piece of that right here on my keys. <laughs> By that guy from, from Taylor, the meteorite dealer. So I don't know why Russia seems to be target one for asteroid impacts, but they, they can have it. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're huge. Yeah, yeah they're probably, yeah. More surface area. 1954? Meteorite blew through this woman's house uh, and smacked her. Bounced off the radio, hit her in the thigh. And I, I think that's the first time a meteorite impact on a human was, was recorded. 1959, year before I was born, the Pibram uh, uh, in Czechoslovakia. Photographed on the asteroid belt. Well, they're finding that a lot now these days. 57, the age, a space age, Sputnik. That is how you pronounce it. I was corrected by a Russian. Sputnik. Sputnik, yeah. 1968. This is probably the public's, the American public's, first introduction to asteroids. I know it was mine. Uh, the Murchison, now this is a fascinating fall in Australia. They found right and left handed amino acids on this thing. Uh, from what I heard, this thing stunk when it fell. It, had, it was just volatiles were coming off of it like crazy. 1970, they took the, the spectra of a meteorite and it was matched exactly to the asteroid Vesta. This is where the, the HEB meteorites came from. 1978, this is, this, is, this is when the dinosaur killer was discovered. The uh, guys doing magnetic surveys over the Yucatan Peninsula found something. They found a giant crater uh, 111 miles wide right there. And uh, a few years later, uh, Alvarez and Alvarez and a couple other folks uh, discovered sedimentary sedimentary layers that had a whole lot of iridium, uh, many times greater uh, percentage than normal. And they linked that to the same time of that Chicxulub impact. So this is what they think happened. They think something came in. I wonder if it would be friends with me. <laughs> nope. So it came in and uh, it, it smacked into the ground. These are images of the latest Cosmos, which uh, I should I should have a video of this, but I'll do it next time. This this impact is great, but it came in, it blew up, and it would have been quite spectacular and uh, awful. It would have punched right through the crust into the mantle. So some giant building-sized chunks or mountain-sized chunks of mantle material being flung up into the atmosphere. And uh, that stuff re-enters, and it re-enters all over the planet. There's evidence for a global firestorm at the time, and this would have caused uh, a, a whole bunch of gunk in the atmosphere, photosynthesis, collapsed. The whole environment goes boom for about a decade. And I said that this this was linked to a, uh, a global extinction. They're thinking about 75% of all the species on the planet vanished at that time. And that's from a <laughs> cartoon on that. I love that. So in the 1980s, the only sky survey programs we had looking for these things were a couple on a mountain. That is about it. 
1980, in the original Cosmos, and this was, this was pretty prophetic, uh, Carl Sagan predicted that an asteroid impact could be mistaken for a nuclear strike. And we're going to have like, the flash, the, the blast wave, just not the radiation. And uh, 1984 to 86, Halley's Comet was going by, and a uh, whole bunch of countries, not us, sent something out to, uh, to visit it. And that was the first time that we saw the nucleus of a comet. And not, my, not a whole lot to see there, but this was, I remember it being absolutely spectacular compared to what we have today at the road set up, but yikes, this was, this was absolutely amazing. Peekskill, New York, this was an amazing fall. It's captured by a whole bunch of people watching football. This thing came in. I love this thing. There's all the football players. Yep. Captured by 16 different people. Has its flight path. It uh, impacted in New York into a car. <laughs> and uh, of Todd Johnson, a buddy of mine actually has a piece of this with red paint on it. Yeah. <laughs> Explain that to the insurance company. He taunts right? me with it when I see him. Yeah. I actually, so I. Today, I don't even get it. $69,000 is what she sold the meteorite for and the car. Today, oh, it would be a lot more than that. So again, they, they had all these videos. They calculated the orbit of the peak seal right out in the, right out in the asteroid belt. Uh, Ida. They flew by Ida uh, on the way to Jupiter, and they found it was a binary. They, they discovered that it had this companion called Dactyl. In 1993, uh, Shoemaker and Levy, amateur astronomers at the time, I am, I am I'm told, uh, discovered that a comet had broken up around Jupiter, and they calculated its orbit, and it was coming right back around, and it was going to plow right into Jupiter, and it did so a year later. And 21 impacts, and uh, it was caught by the Hubble Space Telescope. These were the largest explosions ever witnessed in the solar system, now aside from the sun, and uh, planetary explosions. And uh, at this point, there was no doubt that a cometary or asteroid impact could just cause unbelievable damage. 97, it was 97 the Sky Survey programs, uh, a, couple, a couple more of them came online, but we were only discovering one near-Earth object a month. And most of those, along with a handful of main belt asteroids, so. Uh, this is the Matilda flyby. This is the near Shoemaker spacecraft. Eros was uh, flown by by the same thing. And 98, the comet Borley was flown by Deep Space One. This was uh, this is one of the this, this probe used an ion drive, like, much like the Dawn mission today. That that was the best image we had of a cometary nucleus at the time, even after Halley. Catalina Sky Survey came online in 1998, and this was the uh, around this time is when CCDs came into effect, and uh, these were a boon to astronomy. 2000, uh, near Shoemaker landed on uh, on Eros, and there it remains today. The Sky Survey programs uh, between 99 and 2004, oh, some more were coming online. Catalina was getting upgraded. There was absolute explosion in data. There's a graph here. I'll show you that. Uh, Comet Wild uh, flyby in 2004. The Stardust mission flew right through the tail of this comet, collected up a whole bunch of comet dust, and returned it. That is the nucleus of Comet Wild, and that was that was quite shocking to see. I, I remember seeing it. it was like. That was, that was really weird looking. Catalina Sky Survey, new telescope, output doubled again. So from 2004, from time frame, it just, the, the discovery rate went nuts. Um, oh my goodness, I gotta get one in here. Temple One, going here. This is the one that used that that got that got impact by the, the deep impact probe. Aikatawa. First time we saw that, that was a Japanese probe. It landed, took a sample return, kind of failed, only returned a couple particles, but the particles, well, we'll get to that later. This is the Stardust. They come back, came back, analyzed it, they found glycine in this. 2006, 
Hubble Space Telescope for the first time it images Ceres and Vesta. Look at that, Ceres is round. And in the same year, they reclassified Pluto and Ceres as dwarf planets, and the public went nuts over Pluto, not, not Ceres. I, I kind of wonder if in the 1850s, when, when Ceres was redefined from a planet to an asteroid, did the public go nuts? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't nearly as much time. Yeah, I don't even know about it. And, and there was no dog named Pluto that Disney had. Also, information at the time was not like how it is. Well, yeah, there's, there's no, yeah, no internet saying, hey, this just happened. Oh, no, Massachusetts. This fall in Peru, high up in the mountains was really interesting. It hit 120 meters from a building. It came in incandescent. It was so <laughs> high up, it didn't have a chance to slow down. It boiled groundwater. Several people got sick, and they thought this was going on. <laughs> until, yeah, until they, they found out that there was arsenic in the groundwater, and that's what got vaporized. People were getting sick, but they were honestly thinking it was like viruses from space. 2007, Star Trek got remastered. If you haven't seen them, they look awesome. And uh, they revamped the asteroid to look more like an asteroid. 2008 was Tunguska's 100th anniversary. My buddy Todd. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, <laughs> nice. I laughed real hard when he sent me that picture. Oh, that was great. Uh, I'm not running out of time here, so I'm going to have to go here. There's an asteroid impact in the asteroid belt. It left a big tail, probably from some volatile materials that came off of it. Hayabusa returns with just a few particles. They analyzed it, found micrometeorite impacts all over these particles. So again, we're back to the impacts everywhere. Lutetia flyby in 2010. You see a lot more flybys and stuff. Comet Hartley, our, our imaging of these comets are getting better. This, in uh, 2011, Dawn orbited Vesta, and uh, that probably happened, to, that, that did happen to Vesta twice, about one to two billion years ago, it was round, now it's like that. And it, these huge equatorial troughs formed after the impact. Originally, they thought this thing differentiated. They thought it, just like the Earth, was heading down planetary scale, and, you know, iron core, mantle, and crust. But recently, Brother Guy and a whole bunch of people just uh, put out an abstract saying that Vesta is probably not a remnant protoplanet, but a radically altered, chemically stripped, and re-accreted body. Like I said, it blew apart. Some of the mantle material probably flew up as the, the, the analysis that some of the mantle material is not there that they're expecting it. So he's thinking that this happened. I actually, he sent me this about a, a month before they published this. He says, please don't publish that. This, 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 the thing I saw on physics.online, the comments were saying that Brother Guy uh, and all these people presented this, and a lot of people probably wish he hadn't. But they saw a discrepancy. And this is science happening. You've got to follow up on that. Another fall with a whole bunch of uh, uh, organic material in it. Comet Ison was discovered in 2012. By the way, if Ison had been discovered to be heading toward the Earth, we would have had 14 months. That wouldn't have been enough. Now this graph is really interesting. This shows a asteroid discovery. And you'll note in about 98, it goes crazy. The red line that's flattening out there, that's everything that's above one kilometer, you know, like, the, like the big ones. So that's flattened out. We found most of those. Below one kilometer, that's not flattening out. That, that's heading straight up, and it's continuing to do so. Asteroid discovery is crazy. So look, larger than one kilometer, we've discovered 868. They estimate 981. We haven't found them all yet. And uh, near-Earth asteroids, oh, that number's wrong. It's, it's higher than that today. I have a graph of it on there. But they estimate, we found about 12,000 of them. They estimate that there's a million of them. They're not actually sure. Minor Planet Center says that we discover about 900 near-Earth asteroids a year, but 50,000 to 83,000 asteroids in the main asteroid belt. That, that's a huge number. And I don't have time to actually show that video, but there's a lot of stuff. Well, this is the inner solar system as you're taught in school, right? Mm -hmm. This is the inner solar system as it really is. That's busy. Uh, that's are your slides good. online? They can be. I got all. I got all of the stuff. I, I love to show these to my boys. It will be uh, on I YouTube. A, I found that uh, web article about Mercury. At least the oh, we did. Yeah, yeah. So I'm almost done here. So yeah. 
Now well, the Kuiper belt, she actually talked about this today. This is a, another, another belt of material, not necessarily asteroids, I mean, but it's icy material, out past Neptune. And I gotta get moving, so a whole bunch of those nudged. And that was pretty much it. So, I'm, I've run out of time, I'm sorry. I'm almost done anyway. So these things, uh, thank you. Yeah, these things, there's, there's a lot of them out there. We're still finding out a lot about them, and they, they remain.